Rambo, grab a beer and pull up a deck chair. This is True Crime Island, another true crime podcast, bringing you true crime from around the world. So what a week in Australia. We have missing four-year-old child Cleo Smith. Looks to have been abducted from her family's tent. They're on holidays. And we have the remains of Brian Laundry found in a swamp. There's a $1 million reward out to find Cleo. And this week's show will be all about an abducted child. Or children, actually. So I have nothing much to say about Laundry. I'll probably do an episode about him one day. But I'm sure the topic has been covered pretty well at this stage. All I would have to say is what a fucktard he was and I'd just get the rage. Cleo, well, that investigation is ongoing and thoughts go out to the family and let's hope that has a better ending. All right, this week we go to Illinois and we meet the Sims, Paula and Robert. References tonight are mugshots.com, the Bellevue Nils News Democrat, St. Louis Post, Dispatch, Deanna Graham and Denise Graham, the Department of Psychology, Radford University, Radford, they did a piece and they referenced the following books, which I suggest you go and have a read of these books. I haven't myself, but they look pretty good. It's called Dying Dreams, The Secret of Paula Sims by A. Becker and Precious Victims by Weber D. and J.R.C. Bosworth. We also have court records, as usually Always has some court records. It's good to be able to read some of those. Okay, let's get into it. Paula Sims, born 21st of May, 1959 at Freeman, Missouri. She had two older brothers. Her father worked at Amoco Oil and her mum was a housewife. At age seven, her family moved to La Plata, where her grandfather started sexually molesting her. He would fondle her and wank himself where she could see him and flash his dick at her. By 13, she was hanging out with her older brother, Randy, drinking, shoplifting and smoking dope. She was sexually active by 14 and good at sports, but it started popping her mum's Valium. And then by 16, she was taking LSD with her boyfriend, Evan Dow. Her older brother, Dennis, had brain surgery for seizures and Paula started using his drugs. On the 10th of April, 1976, aged nearly 17, she was in a car crash with her brother Randy, who was 19 at the time, and he died at the scene. Paula had facial injuries, and Randy had drugs in his blood system. In May of 76, the family moved to Wood River, Illinois. Paula went to Lewis and Clark Community College in 78, doing a key punch course that she failed to complete. Okay, now for the young'uns out there, before the new digital age of smartphones and internet, there used to be these big, very loud machines that had a keyboard connected to them. As you typed into the keyboard, holes would be punched into a card and later fed into a card reader that would read the holes punched and the data would be extracted. Make a mistake and you have to feed a new card in and start that card again. Early data entry. Anyway, Paula was a loner at school, but had a couple of friends, and they would become very close. In 1978, she heard the song Lorelei by Wishbone Ash, and told her friend she would love to have a baby girl, and she would call her Lorelei. Now, this is an important bit to remember. Paula wants a daughter. She has a favourite song, and wants to call her daughter the name of the song. Now, Paula would work for National Food Store as a cashier, but get fired for undercharging her friends. She was introduced to Robert Sims at a rock concert, and they hit it off, getting married just a year or so later. Robert Sims, born on April the 20th, 1952, in Carbondale, Illinois, a son of Troy and Wilma Sims. Robert was a United States Navy veteran. He would become a paper mill worker and a trailer park attendant. Okay, so Robert and Paula were married on the 2nd of May, 1981, and in 83, they moved to Gotter Road, Brighton, Illinois. And this is out in the sticks a little bit. On the 5th of June, 1986, their first child, Lorelei Marie, was born. Paula would return from the hospital on the 8th of June. Okay, so previously I mentioned Paula wanted a baby daughter and would call it Lorelei. 
She must have been so happy. But this happiness would soon turn to tragedy when on the night of the 17th of June, just 12 days after the birth of her daughter, Lorelai would be gone. According to Paula, at around 10.30pm, a man dressed in black wearing a ski mask forced her at gunpoint to lie on the basement floor. He then took Lorelai from her bed and fled. Robert was at the Alton Boxboard Company where he worked late shift at the time, so Paula ran to her neighbour's house shouting, Help me, help me, someone took my baby. Then described to a neighbour how a masked man with a gun came in, told her to lay on the floor or he'd kill her. She then heard the door close and when she got up, Lorelai was gone from the bassinet. Now, the police were called while Minnie Gray, that's the name of her neighbour, sat with Paula in the house. While they were sitting there, the dog ran out of the house and when Paula got the dog back in, she said, I don't want to lose you too. Now, Minnie asked if the dog had barked when this masked man came around and Paula said no. But this confused Minnie a bit because she knew the dog barked at anyone walking anywhere near the house and wondered how someone could break into the house and the dog not bark. She also had, hadn't seen nor heard any vehicles outside the Sims' house. Now, Minnie's house is on 34332 Gotta Road, if you want to Google it and see what I'm talking about. And next to her place, you'll see is a long gravel driveway up to the Sims' house, which isn't actually listed as a street number anywhere I can find, but you can see it on Google Maps. But if you Google 34332 Gotta Road, where, where Minnie's place is, you'll see that there's only a few houses there and they're on large acreages. Like I said, they're out in the sticks a bit. Now, when I lived in the bush, you noticed every car driving by. So Minnie definitely would have heard a car driving up a long, especially a long gravel driveway for sure. And I'm sure many, and apparently the poor old dear is about 87 and still lives there, I'm sure she was listening out for any sound. Now, anyway, Robert, he gets home and he's shocked that someone's broken in, attacked Paula and stolen their newborn baby. There would be a press conference with Paula and Robert distraught, begging for the return of Lorelei. They hold up a handwritten sign for the media. and It's just handwritten. It's nothing printed out like they have today. And it just says, Have you seen Lorelei abducted from Brighton home? Tuesday night, the 17th of June. And Paula, well, she had tears flowing down her cheeks as she spoke to the reporters. And she said, I just want her back. Robert said, They could have stolen anything I own. They could have burned my house down or sent me to war again. But nothing could compare to this tragedy. Okay, so I don't have any video of this press conference. Just a couple of newspaper photos. So it's hard to see if they're genuinely grieving or telling lies or if they have some sort of guilty knowledge. Anyway, on the 20th of June, Robert and Paula are given lie detector tests. Now, a relative would tell reporters that they'd passed these tests and the previous days of interviews had been stressful for the couple. But they knew that it was part of police procedure to clear potential suspects, especially close family, so that they could get on with the investigation. Police said that Paula's account of what happened had remained consistent during questioning, but they would say that the results of the polygraph indicated they weren't telling the truth. So the family relative was saying one thing, but the cops were basically saying, they're not telling all the truth. So this is quite interesting. On the 24th of June, just a week after Lorelei went missing, skeletal remains were found about 150 feet, that's about 50 metres, behind the Sims home in dense woods, like in a small ravine. Now, from the photos I saw, it looked like animals had gotten to the body and distributed bones across the immediate area. Paula and Robert refused to believe it was Lorelei, but forensic testing of the remains yielded a 97.2% certainty that it was her. Now, the news reports of the remains being found about 150 feet. Now, it's only 50 metres, like I said, from the Sims' backyard. Now, I'm not sure how correct that is, as police had searched the area around the house pretty well. 
Maybe the remains were moved there at a later date. I don't know. The pathologist who performed the autopsy on Lorelei believed that someone had placed their hands over Lorelei's nose and mouth until she suffocated. Although this report, I really can't confirm as other references say the cause of death couldn't be 100% determined as they were mainly skeletal remains. What can be sure of is that it was a homicide. The cops at this stage have Robert and Paula as their prime suspects, but they don't have enough evidence to do anything about their suspicions. There's no unknown fingerprints at the scene, no forced entry, and Minnie didn't hear any cars going past at the time. After the remains are given a proper burial, Robert and Paula move away from the area and move to 1053 Washington Avenue, Alton, Madison County, Illinois. Now, this is only about 20 or 30 minutes drive south of Goddard Road. Now, Robert would go on to say, What I can't believe is how little support we've got from the world in general. We've been condemned. Yeah, this always happens when a kids or kids go missing, the family of paraded in front of the press and people will think yes they're guilty or no they're not guilty anyway on the 1st of february 1988 paula would give birth to a son randall troy or randy sims that was the name of her late brother randy that died in the car crash 22 years before troy was robert's father's name robert was so happy to have a son he was just absolutely ecstatic It wouldn't be long before the birth of their third child, Heather Lee Sims, on the 18th of March, 1989. At the hospital, just after giving birth, Robert Sims wasn't happy at all once he found out he had a daughter. He was under the impression he was getting another son. He was noticeably pissed off. Then on the night of April the 29th, 1989, at around 11pm, Robert Sims comes home after working a late shift to see Paula unconscious on the kitchen floor. He woke her up and she told him that a masked man had pulled a gun on her while she was outside putting out the rubbish. The gunman then karate chopped her on the back of the neck and she fell unconscious. Robert ran to check on the kids. Randy, now 15 months old, was asleep in his bed. But six-week-old Heather Lee was missing. Robert frantically looks around for Heather, but then calls the police. After hearing Paula's story about a masked gunman knocking her out and stealing her baby, the police spent very little time looking for this phantom baby snatcher. Instead, they suspected Robert and Paula as the perpetrators pretty much straight away. Then on May the 3rd, just four days after Heather went missing, a fisherman, Charles Saunders, at the car park of the old Lock and Dam 26 location, noticed a large black rubbish bag in the bottom of a bin. He thought it was strange, being a large rubbish bag, it looked like something was in it. He decided to take it out and see what was in it. To his horror, he saw the body of a baby inside. When police were called, they noticed that the baby, which was a girl, looked almost like it was just asleep. It had no signs of decomposition. Using footprints taken at birth, the baby would be identified as six-week-old Heather Lee Sims. The autopsy on Heather's body showed she'd been smothered as she had cuts under her lip. She had signs of frostbite as well, indicating she'd been stored in a freezer for some time. Well, this didn't look good for Robert and Paula. Two babies snatched by a masked gunman, only to be found dead shortly after. There's no ransom demands. They'd moved house after the first so-called abduction murder, but it happens again. They had no enemies or involvements in drugs or crime. There was no reason for police to believe Paula's story. A search warrant on the home of Paula and Robert would find something very interesting. Black plastic bags, same as the ones that Heather was dumped in. They were found in the Sims kitchen. Now, the brand of bag was very common. There were millions of them produced, so investigators had a really close look at them and they also contacted the manufacturer. Now, I've had quite a bit to do with plastic bags in the past and I used to go buy them directly from the manufacturer and I used to use a bag sealer as well to seal them up. Now, these black plastic bags, if you look close at them, 
you'll see streaks in the colouring. Now, this isn't a perfect pattern of streaks. Rather, it does vary over time as each bag goes through the manufacturing process. Then the bags are on a long spindle, cut or have perforations, you know, where you rip the bag from another one, and they're heat sealed on one end. Now, every cut and every heat seal is slightly different as the cutting and heating surfaces get build-ups accumulating on them. Now, this might only get cleaned off once a day, a week, or whenever, but the colour streaks, the cuts, the perforations, and the heat seals for each bag will be very similar bag to bag, but from bag 1 to, say, bag 100, it will be quite different. Investigators noticed that the bag Heather was found in and the next unused bag in the Sims kitchen had almost the same colour streaks. They had the same defects in the cut and markings in the heat seal. The manufacturer advised that these two bags were produced within seconds of each other. So it was highly likely that the bag Heather was found in was taken from the kitchen of The Sims. Also, Paula's DNA was found on the bag that Heather was found in, but there were no fingerprints on there. Maybe whoever did that, or if it was Paula, wore gloves. But I only found one reference to there being Paula's DNA on the bag. But it's pretty damning evidence. By chance, Dr. Mary Case, the medical examiner that did Heather's autopsy, was also a neuropathologist. And she told investigators that the story that Paula had told them that she'd been knocked unconscious, but she remembered right up until she got karate chopped to the back of the neck, she said that doesn't make any sense. For one, there was no bruising found of the type that would knock her out. And Dr. Case said, that she wouldn't be able to remember the minutes before she got knocked out, let alone the karate chop part. So she shouldn't have been able to remember the guy forcing her in the house and attacking her and doing that karate chop. It's not looking good for Paula and Robert, two dead babies, both girls, just after they're born. And the cops think they, think they actually did kill the first one, but didn't have enough evidence to charge him. Now they're finding out that at least the second murder is pointing to the parents. Paula and Robert are arrested and they're taken downtown. Now Randy, he's taken into state care. Now I'm not 100% sure if Robert told them this next bit before or after he was arrested. Robert tells police that when Heather went missing... Now, get this, the sex with Paula had been fantastic. It was like a stress reliever. Now, what the, what the, what the fuck did he fuck that he could say that? His daughter's missing and he's saying, oh, it's great. Now we're having great sex. But that's not all. One of the women in the same ward as Paula when she was having a baby, she told police that she overheard Paula crying and apologising to a pissed off Robert for having a baby girl. Now get this. When Paula had Lorelai, Robert made her sleep in another room with the baby as he was that pissed off for getting a daughter. He made him sleep in the basement. Paula was only let back into the marital bed once Lorelai was gone. Now when Randy was born, Robert was elated that he had a son and was all happy, happy as Larry. But when Heather Lee was born, again, Robert made Heather and Paula sleep downstairs in the dining room because Heather's crying would disturb him and his beloved son, Randy. Now, Paula told a friend that she had this sleeping arrangement because she's been kicked out of the bed and that she would have to do something about it. Now, that was, she said that to her friend just before Heather went missing. Then... As Robert told police, after Heather was gone, he and Paula had the best sex ever. This is all crazy. But we can see where this is going. Robert was at work both times his daughters went missing, so it must have been Paula who either acted on her own or with the knowledge of Robert that, you know, Paula was the one who murdered the babies. Now, under tense questioning by police, Robert Sims would end up telling them that he had a suspicion that Paula had killed both his daughters. This would see Paula become the main focus of the investigation. On July the 2nd, 1989, Paula is charged with the murder of Heather Lee. 
There isn't enough evidence to charge Robert and police at this stage are still 50-50 on whether he was involved. Even though he had an alibi because he was at work, they thought he may have been an accomplice and helped hide the bodies. Okay, so Heather's body had been frozen. Well, when Robert was at work, Paula smothered Heather, causing the skin under the top lip to be cut. Paula then took her body, placed it in a garbage bag and drove to her parents' place. Her parents were on holidays and they weren't in. They were on holidays for a few weeks. Paula put the garbage bag with Heather in the bag, of course, in their large chest freezer in the garage. When her parents found out the next day that Heather was missing, they told Paula they would cut their holiday short and come back for support. Now, Paula freaked out and had to race back to her parents' house to get the garbage bag with Heather in it and stash it somewhere else. Well, she brought it back to her own house and stashed it in her own freezer in the garage until she got the opportunity three days later to drive the short distance down to the Lock and Dam 26 car park and dump her daughter in the rubbish bin. Now, of course, we know the rest. Eventually, Paula would admit to killing both Lorelei and Heather. She was convicted on one count of first-degree murder, two counts of obstructing justice, and one count of concealing a homicide, as well as three counts of obstructing justice on top of that. Robert divorced Paula soon after her conviction and would go on to marry again. Paula would be sentenced to life without parole and go through a series of appeals as they do. Okay, so remember at the start when I said that Paula wanted a daughter and she would call her Lorelei? Well, that was before Robert was on the scene. And when they did have a daughter, Robert wasn't happy at all. He basically banished Paula and Lorelei to another room. Now, by the time they had Randy, Robert, he was really happy. Then when Heather was born again, Robert banished Paula and Heather to the dining room to sleep. When police searched the family home, there were no photos of Heather or Lorelei displayed anywhere, only photos of Robert. Okay, so Heather and Lorelei didn't really live long enough to have a lot of photos taken, but photos were taken, they're in the newspapers, but they just were never on display in the house. So for Robert to get off scot-free doesn't, really feel right to me I'm not giving Paula a big out here but she must have been under a lot of pressure and had no support from her husband Robert as for postpartum depression that Paula tried to use as an excuse this is what she said due to postpartum psychosis I had auditory and visual hallucinations voices told me to hurt them and said that I was a bad mother I visualized demons dead children and a masked gunman. At times I was kind of normal, but those times were fewer and fewer as the days progressed. Look, I don't know. Maybe that was part of it. I don't know. Why didn't they just give the daughters up for adoption if she was going to stay with Robert and he wasn't going to tolerate having a daughter? I don't think Robert knew Paula was going to kill Lorelei and Heather, but I'm sure he was worried after Heather's death that Randy, his beloved son, was in danger. Maybe Robert did help hide the bodies. We'll never know now because there's another tragic twist to this story. On June the 20th, 2015, Robert at 63 at the time and Randy 27 were both killed in a car crash in Jackson, Mississippi. They were headed to Pass Christian where they planned to do missionary work. Their Jeep was hit by a Yolanda McNeely who was driving drunk. The collision caused the Sims Jeep to crash off an overpass onto the road below. You can imagine how terrifying that would be. Now, McNeely tried to flee. She drove on. She ended up crashing at the next exit. Lorelei, Heather, Robert and Randy are all buried in the same plot at Woodland Hills Cemetery, Wood River, Madison County, Illinois. Now, photos of the gravestone at first, they show the names of Lorelei, Heather, and even though they were still alive at the time, Paula and Robert. There was also two heart shapes with mum and dad written in each heart respectively. Now they must have planned to all be buried together at some stage but when Robert and Randy died Paula's name was taken out and replaced with Randy's name and in the heart shape with the word mum that that heart was just chiseled out. 
It was gone. How's that for Paula? Her beloved son that she called Randy is killed in the same manner as her beloved brother, Randy. Look, she may have loved Randy, but he certainly didn't love her back after he knew what had happened with the sisters. Now, I suppose Robert, who's free all this time, made sure all the blame went to Paula. Okay, so Paula, what's she up to today? Well, guess what? She's just been released from prison. On Thursday, the 28th of October, 21, yes, a couple of days before I'm recording and this episode's going to get released, Paula Sims was granted parole. Paula was released from Logan Correctional Centre in Lincoln, Illinois, around 3.30 p.m. Friday. Well, there you go, Islanders. What do you think of it all? Everyone's dead except for Paula. Do you think she's done enough time for what she did? Look, I reckon Paula always wanted a girl and she was so happy when Lorelai was born. But this angered Robert, who wanted a son. With all the stress of having a baby, being banished to the basement and all that sort of postpartum stuff, Paula lost it and she killed Lorelai. Robert may or may not have known this at the time and subsequently he either did or didn't help Paula dispose of the body. With Heather, I think the same happened. Robert was being a dick because he wanted a son and the same thing happened. Paula lost it and killed Heather. Again, I'm not sure how much involvement Robert had, but thankfully, this time the cops were able to get enough evidence to secure a conviction. Robert got off, even though I believe he's actually the main instigator of all these murders. If he hadn't been such a prick to Paula, she wouldn't have killed her daughters. She said how much she wanted a daughter. It makes no sense for her to kill her daughters unless under extreme coercion from Robert. Well, I guess karma got Robert in the end. But that's so sad for Randy. Okay, so that's the end of this episode. Honestly, I had no idea that Paula was getting out this week. It was only as I'm starting to do research that I found she was getting released. As far as I was concerned, she had life without parole, but she got parole. So, what do you think, Islanders? What do you think of this whole situation? Okay, so I'd like to thank my patrons, past and present, for keeping the island's light on. Lights on. <laughs> light on. Yeah, that's about all we got left. Thank you so much, Samantha Ray. Boom fuckalungas. And special thanks to all my patrons, past and present. Thank you so much. If you'd like to throw a dollar my way, please check out patreon.com forward slash true crime island. Or if you just want to shout me a beer, you can donate to paypal.me true crime island forward slash true crime island. A free beer is always nice after all this dumpster diving I have in these cases, just like Xander McLeod did this week. Boom fuckalunga. But can I just ask you that you take the time to share the podcast with your friends or even in groups on Facebook or wherever. The Island is one of the only few truly independent true crime podcasts out there. I'm commercial free as well. Because of the straight up nature of how I bring the show to you, this isn't going to get me into the Apple new and noteworthy or whatever as such. So I do rely on your help in getting the word out there. Best of all, it's free of charge to help the Island out. I'm also on Audible now, so please rate and review me there if you're on that service. There's quite a few podcasts on Audible now, so you might find it a better alternative to listening in, especially if you have an Alexa. I can just speak to you through Alexa. Okay, you can go to my website, truecrimeisland.com, where you can stream each episode if you don't want to use all these iTunes or pod players or Alexas. I have links to merch social media there as well. You can email me if you want to get in touch, which is always the best way to get in touch. That's about it. I've been your host, Cambo. You've been listening to True Crime Island. As I always say, don't forget to delete your browser history. Good night. Fuck a lunker.